have the honor of receiving uh, one of Latin America's most so after uh, periodista, because we're in Spanglish here today. Uh, Maria Celeste Arraraz, thank you so much for receiving us. In I the love being here with you. You know how much <laughs> I appreciate you, admire you, and thank cherish you. you. Thank you. Um, I grew up seeing you on television. You know, we're basically almost the same age. That has nothing to do <laughs> right. with it. Um, and I remember growing up on TV. I grew up in the, in the 90s in Connecticut. Mi abuela uh, would always have Univision on. And so she would put, it would put Cristina, and then you would come on. Afterwards. Impacto. Yes. And so seeing you and having you in person, and, and I know for the team, uh, is an honor because you're a legend Thank to you. us. And Thank so, you, guys. And uh, so I just wanted to honor you in that way. Uh, Maria Celeste, I, there's so much, uh, so many things that you've done in your career and so much that you contribute to. A few things I wanted to mention is you were the first Latin journalist to win an Emmy, and I believe you won three. Is that correct? To win a national Emmy. A national Emmy. Yeah, because a lot of people, I mean, th that's something interesting. A lot of people uh, don't realize they have regional Emmys and national Emmys. But this Emmy in particular was um, a real big honor because it was for career achievement. So it wasn't because of a story you did or something, okay. you know, uh, even though that's a great acknowledgement right, right, and right. recognition regardless, mm -hmm. but this was a career one. So that was like something that really you know, made me feel good about it. Yeah. And I know in Puerto Rico, I have family that still live there, and they're like, ay, Maria Celeste, que chula, we love her. Uh, Puerto Rico loves you very much. And I know that your family were politicians in Puerto Rico. How was it for you growing up with a family that was in the public eye already, knowing that you wanted to enter into this profession? Well, I said I never wanted to be in the public eye. <laughs> I hated it because my father used to be a very well-known politician and, 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 you know, he was a, a civil servant mm -hmm. and, um, he was, he was the kind of person that was always very open with people that came up to us for an autograph or take a picture. Yeah. But that meant that every time we were having dinner together at a restaurant, we got like 10 interruptions per, <laughs> per meal. So it was really annoying. And I said, I don't mm -hmm. want that in my life. That's yeah. not going to be me. And here, here I am, there you, you are. know? <laughs> but I learned from him to, to always be gracious and to understand something that is very important, that that second when somebody sits down and asks you for an autograph or a photograph, for that person, it takes a lot of courage to ask. Because, yeah. I, I mean, I, I have people that I, yeah. I'm a um, fan of. Like who? Like, well, back in the day, before all the scandals and everything, I used to love Mel Gibson when he was oh, young. I used yeah, to think he yeah. was perfect. Yeah. Which eventually one day I ended up interviewing him, and I'll tell wow. you about that. But... Um, Basically, you know, I have a, I have a lot of people that I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Angelina Jolie because she oh, has such yes. a big heart yes. and, you know, she's so giving and people that give. I mean, Bill Gates, which I know yeah. nowadays is controversial, but it's a guy that has, you know, uh, donated millions and millions and millions mm -hmm. for the cure of, of illnesses like malaria, for example. Mm -hmm. And that has to be acknowledged. So I admire a lot of people. And if I run into them, I think I would be a little embarrassed to us. And if I get the courage to ask, <laughs> yeah. I want them to treat me nice. I want them to, right. to be, you know, to be decent, to be nice you know? Yeah. So, so I learned from him to be that way. Well, it's funny you say that because mi papa is bien farandulero. And he's part of the reason that I have a lot of pictures with legends. And I do have a photo of you when yes, I was like 17. Do. Yes, we do. And uh, Bobby's like, Mete day, Mete day. I'm like, Maria, want to take a picture? You're like, yeah, sure. And so you definitely are, are speaking something that you live out. Uh, that day was you and Edie Chacon in Orlando. Oh, my God. I yeah. remember. Well, imagine that. such a legend. You I know? know. I grew up, you know, yeah. seeing Edie Chacon, you know, uh, when she was, how, she was in the different yeah. shows. That was like the week. first J-Lo, I feel like. She was she was a J-Lo. Right. Yeah, J-Lo is a, an evolution of Edie Chacon. Right. Oh, that's a good word. Yeah. Okay. And so I, I, I know we stopped there at, at the first uh, Latin International, right, journalist. Um, you have three stars in Puerto Rico, DR, and in Mexico, I believe, as well. Yeah. Este, we, you're also an author, and you have a book called The Secretos de Selena, and you also have it on Amazon Prime, which I watched yes. the whole series. Did you like I had, it? I loved it. I'm I loved um, seeing the aspect of your personal life and how it intersected with your career. It did. Um, in a great way. And you share a lot of personal things. Honestly, when I look at your life, when I see your work, I feel like you've gone through almost everything that a woman everything. could go through everything everything i swear to god i mm -hmm. i have I, I i remember there was a time in which um i was going through a lot of things and people in espanol would come mm -hmm. out with a cover every time something happened and then they came out with this covered with this cover mm -hmm. after like five of them that was all 
crazy stuff that was mm -hmm. happening in my life. And they, the title of it was, it was my picture. And it yeah. said, ¿Qué más le puede pasar? What oh. else can happen to her? I said, <laughs> exactly. I was so, I said, that's exactly what I say. And so how do you, in those moments, um, you know, I think it's so hard. And I've, I've, I've been in the industry working with celebrities for probably a solid year. And I've been able to compartir, you know, just normal, like every other human. And um, how do you deal with having your personal life or personal things that happen, like you shared in your in your documentary or in the Secretos de Selena, you had a miscarriage. Yes. Like that. How do you, um, do you decompartmentalize, like they say the men do, or do you kind of like immerse yourself in your work and you kind of deal with it as it, as it comes? I, I'm, I'm, I've always been an optimist. Okay. And I always say that in life, you cannot say why, why this happened to me, why, 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 like a lot of people do, unfortunately. Yeah. Because that's a that's a victim's attitude. You have right. to say for what reason, uh -huh. because there's always a reason. There's always a hidden lesson in everything that happens to you. Always, mm -hmm. you just have to be calm, wait, be patient, because it will reveal to you. Right. It will be revealed to you eventually, and you will learn something out of it. And that's why you have to be very observant of things that happen in your life, because that's the only way you learn to be better every time. So no, so I was always very um, optimistic about things, mm -hmm. and even in the in the worst of times and the most painful times, I always found refuge in my work and that I love. And I have, I've always had a passion for that and for life itself. So mm -hmm. I've always been very optimistic. And that's what I tell people, you know, you have to be always optimistic. That's, that's one of the keys to be successful, especially happy in life. Mm -hmm. And who, who's, a, who's a mentor for Maria Celeste? Who do you look up to? I have a lot of mentors. I think, my, I think early on into my life, it was my father mm -hmm. because he's the one that taught me how to always pursue excellence yep. by example. Right. He always showed me by example and uh, about not giving up and determination. I used to be a swimmer because he, you know, yeah. he was on top of me for being a swimmer. I was very <laughs> talented, but I, you know, I was in that age that I wanted to be with my friends. And, <laughs> and if it wasn't because he was on top of me, you know, really, you know, putting discipline yeah. and, and demanding discipline from my, my part, I would not have become, I, I was an Olympic chef. I mean, I made a team too for the Olympics wow. at one time. And uh, I didn't get to compete because I got sick right the week before we were supposed to travel. So that was very tragic. But I learned something out of that. And mm -hmm. there's always a lesson behind, like I said. But my father always taught me how to be um, a person that that always does extra. Like, for example, we used to, we used to swim five days a week. Mm -hmm. And then my father took it upon himself to become my coach on the sixth day. <laughs> and he would take me to the pool with a, you know, chronometer uh -huh. to, to start have me Testing. do laps. And I was like, what's going on? Isn't the day that I'm supposed to, to, to relax? And he would always tell me, he says, you know what? If the others train five days, you have to train more an extra day because if not, you're going to be like the others. You're going to be mediocre. Right. And in this life, he always used to say, he says, you can be the best or the best or the best of the worst, but never mediocre. You wow. come to your house, to the house with an A or with an F, oh but never bring home a C. He used to say that oh to me. And of course, you know, that's that's a lesson I learned about being excellent into whatever you do. So that's is interesting because I'm seeing, I feel like a parallel where you covered, you were very interested in Selena's story yeah. because I know you were the first reporter to announce her death. And yeah. then we also see from the outside that her father was very much uh, seeming to be very aggressive to make sure that her career, that she was the best. Yes. And so I'm also seeing that. That's why she was good. Right. That's she, was she was good, good and she worked hard for it. And, but then I'm yeah. also seeing that your son is starting his career. And I'm wondering if, if that's also going to be how you how you become a mama. Oh, I'm, or... I am very, de very demanding with him. Yeah. Like he'll tell you, he'll have an interview. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if he does well, yeah. I say it was pretty good, but, and then I'll give him a list of things that he can do better the next time, because that's yeah. the only way. I mean, right. people out there will, will criticize you right. and will not tell you to your face. Your mother and the people that love you are always going to tell you the things the way they are. Right. And it's always going to be for your, your improvement. Right. I agree. And the best critic is to come with somebody who actually loves you. Exactly. So um, being uh, three decades on television, I've seen you even do debates with presidents, and I, I swear it doesn't look like nothing scares you. First of all, 
I don't believe anything Telemundo says. For the record, you have said publicly that you loved Telemundo in the past. But uh, it is not just a Telemundo poll. We I, have the I tape. love them. I love them. <laughs> All right. Well, it's not the only poll. <laughs> they're fine. Uh, you know what? They're night, fine. Let me, let me, let me finish, they're please. Fine. Of only oh, like a hundred. Let me finish, please. Of a hundred. Has there ever been a moment that you're saying, oh my God, que hago aquí? Or what am oh, I yeah, doing? Oh yeah, of course. Of course. How do you maneuver through that? Well, that goes back to my father, because when I used to go into the pool at six o'clock in the morning every day, because we have uh, practice in the morning and at night. And in the morning ones, um, sometimes it used to be, the water used to be very cold. Oh, it was wow. freezing cold. The first two minutes, it's torture. And um, it was dark outside. It was very cool. And, um, and um, he, I would say, I would always go and tip, put my, my toes, toes in the water. Uh -huh. And I'd be like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> and he's like, don't put your toes in the water. Because if you do that, you're going to chicken out. Yeah. In life, you have to throw yourself in the water and you start swimming and you're going to get warm up real fast. So whenever you see a challenge or something that you're not afraid of, don't think about it. Jump right in and start swimming and it will go away. And so I, I applied that to so many things in my life that I would be petrified. The first time I went on television, I thought my heart was going to come out of my chest. <laughs> I was so nervous, of course. Uh -huh. yeah. and, um, and even in this career, after the years have gone by, there have always been instances in which I had new challenges mm -hmm. that I would get nervous, of course. The first time I went to the Today Show as a co-host yes, that I was invited, mm -hmm. I was dying because of my English and my accent. Yeah, and, which is um, perfect. No, it isn't. I have a big, big accent. My, <laughs> my, kids... Span my English, Spanish accent is worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, still, there's no, no, uh -huh. no respite knowing that I had to be in front of so many people. Claro, right. And, you know, you get judged for how you speak. Right. And um, so I, I, I always remember, like my father said, I'm going. Let me know. Stop wondering about how cold the water is. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it. I and then that's that. how you do it, yeah. Well, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm swimming. Yeah, swim, swim <laughs> fast, <laughs> as fast as you can. <laughs> as fast as you can. <laughs> so um, I did see that about you being on Today's show, and I could understand the pressure of your audience is probably people who don't know you, and it's their first impression exactly. of you. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so I get that. Um, so now we're in a place where, where everybody's reinventing themselves. Uh, I'm reinventing myself with the YouTube channel. I, I normally am behind the camera taking pictures. Um, I know that your your son has started his career yes, in music. Has. How have you been reinventing yourself uh, in your life? Maybe I'm thinking you're reinventing yourself as a momager. What they as call a it. momager, yeah. <laughs> right now I'm a momager. I um, I didn't know anything about uh, the music industry mm -hmm. except interviewing artists. Right. And then this happened that I had all of a sudden so much time available mm -hmm. because I'm no longer in my you know, right. former show. And I, I've enjoyed it because it's like a, a new challenge, getting to know anything about the industry, mm -hmm. trying to help my son, and then using the, the, the contacts that I've had of a lifetime to help him out because right. it's a very tough career and, and, and help him open the door, even though he knows that mm -hmm. it's the rest is his. Right. And luckily enough, he's very talented. So mm -hmm. I'm lucky that that, I mean, if he wasn't, I wouldn't go into this project with him, even if he wanted to, because I, I wouldn't want him to suffer right. and have rejection. I know how mm -hmm. painful that can be. So the only reason why I'm doing it is because he's truly talented, number one, and number two, because he's truly passionate about it and he's willing to do the work. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know, you have a beautiful story of love with your son, really, oh, yeah. where um, I saw that you actually did an in you were on a job in Russia. Right. And you felt an anxiety of like there's something here that's something that's going to be of value in this country that I love that I'm going to come back. Yeah. for. But you didn't know what it was for. I had been sent out to work on the uh, on the fall of the Soviet Union. That is going to that's going to date me immediately. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And when I, the last day I was there after spending three weeks in Moscow, mm -hmm. I, I was looking at the window and I knew all of a sudden that I it was like the, the strangest thing. It was like an anxiety like uh, nostalgia, like mm -hmm. excitement. It was sadness. It was a little bit of everything. And I knew I was going to come back for a great love. But mm -hmm. I just thought at the time that it was going to be the great love of a man. Mm -hmm. And fast forward 15 years, I came back with my then husband. Um, I was, we already had a son, mm -hmm. biological son, my oldest son. I was pregnant with my daughter and we were going there to adopt a child. And as we were taking a picture in Red Square, um, the photographer was in front of me and over the shoulder of the photographer, I saw the 
the room, the hotel room where I was the day that I was leaving Moscow, that I was so anxious. Mm -hmm. And it was at that moment that I understood that the, the great love I was coming back for was the love of a child, not the mm -hmm. love of man. Wow. And then I uh, saw that you were pregnant with your daughter when you guys, um, so and in the process of you having, going through the adoption, do they bring children from, can you get a child from any country? No, it's, you have to do your homework. Um, okay. Each country has different rules mm -hmm. and uh, different methods, and you have to really get to know them before you get into a situation that might be complicated. Uh, in my case, um, I tried through a few countries, and, and it was complicated for different reasons. Mm -hmm. There was a country in which I tried to adopt children from an um, Indian tribe, oh, and then wow. it was an orphanage where the nuns had the little kids that mm -hmm. were abandoned from that tribe, but then when I went to ask them, they said, you know, we, we have this orphanage, but we really don't give the kids for adoption. I'm like, why? Mm -hmm. He goes, because we rescue these kids from the um, indigenous people. Otherwise, they can, uh, they will probably, I mean, they don't want to be shared. They don't want to have the racist mix. Oh, okay. So if we don't, if we give them away to other people, they're not going to bring them to us in the future. So who knows? They're going to might leave them abandoned oh. in the side of the road. So it might be wow. counterproductive for the future ch kids. Mm -hmm. So that didn't work out. And then I tried in other countries that it was very complicated. And then they had some, in some places they had scandals. And I said, you know, I'm trying to do something good here. I don't mm -hmm. want to. So I said, I'm going to go really far away, <laughs> you know, in which I adopt my child. And nobody's going to come like in the novelas yeah. 10 years later saying, this is my child. <laughs> give it back. You know? No. Okay. So you were able to choose. So you had problems going through other countries for different reasons. But then Russia was seems At like At the time, easier. they were making it easy. Now, I, I understand that right now it's not as easy as it used to be. Okay. And so then you went to Russia. You see the, your, your son. Um, and I understood that he was at 13 months where yes, he him. wasn't sitting yet really. And, um, he looked a little bit sad from what you described, but and you and your husband, at he the had time, a lot of issues, right? Because he needed yeah. some love is what I what love and said. nutrition and, and, uh, interaction with human beings. He was really abandoned in a crib right. and he was, that's where he lived like along with the other kids and they, the kids couldn't play with each other. Uh, they had like wow. two women for 60 kids and anybody that's been a parent mm -hmm. knows that that. You know, that involves a lot of neglect for all right. the kids. So they had a lot of, um, you know, issues in terms of, 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 of everything. You mm. know, he couldn't speak. He couldn't really sit or walk or crawl. or I mean, wow. he was like really he had physical problems, socializing problems. One of the major things that you said when you, you and your, your husband at the time went outside to take him to get fresh air and the nurse was saying, uh, be be careful because he hasn't really been in the daylight since because he came in the night. I thought that was incredible yes. to hear that. He he had never seen a man, so he, we have to be careful. Wow. He had never seen a man, and he had never seen the day the the sunlight. Mm -hmm. And because they had them in this room, I mean, when you, again when you have sixty kids and two women, just just changing the diapers, which they hardly did, by the way, mm -hmm. wow. uh, was a, a real big issue because it takes you a long time. And the same thing with bathing and, and feeding them. It, it was total total neglect because they didn't have enough bodies to take care of the kids. And and that showed. Mm -hmm. And at this time, you were already in your career. Yeah. You were already established. So you have a, a son already at home in Miami. You're pregnant. You adopt a son who is going to take a lot of your time because yeah. you want him to grow healthy. Um, and you're managing this career in life. How, you know, sometimes people think that women can't do everything. And obviously... <laughs> You pretty much seem to have been doing everything. How were you um, during that time of your headspace as a mom, a wife, a woman in business? How were you taking it day by day? Was it? Um, yeah, I was compartmentalizing things, you know, like yeah. I would be at work and I was doing that until I got a phone call from home and then I would right. come home and deal with everything. And then, um, you know, and it, it, it truly they say that it takes a village to bring up a child. In the case of Adrian Badim, mm -hmm. my son from Russia, it took a whole city <laughs> because, um, of course, because of all these issues, yeah. develop, development. Right. He was he was delayed developmentally, right. yep. and um, so it took my mother, uh, my 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 step. I mean, my yeah. um, my stepmother too. Right. It took my uh, mother-in-law, uh, my ex-husband, yeah. the, the brothers. You know, everybody, wow. the nanny that we had. Everybody had to pitch in and help my sisters because he needed a lot of therapy. And now right. when you see him, you would never thought what he right. went through and what we went through to help him. 
Right. And I think it's a beautiful story because I, uh, f- to be able to adopt someone, is you're choosing them. They're, and if Absolutely. They have that neglect, pro- I think, from birth, yes. right? Even though they're not totally conscious of what's happening. Uh, but to be chosen and to be loved uh, and being born from your heart, really, I think that's a beautiful story. It is. I, I always tell people that the best decision I made in my life was to adopt Adrian. Yeah. And to adopt a child is you love them the same, and it's an it's an it's a it's a it's a life changing decision for the good for the better. I mean, you, you become a better person, and it, and it's really something that you never forget. And so you have I know you have three children. Um, you have your oldest son Julian. You have your daughter, yes. and then your your son. Um, how do you right now? With during the pandemic, how have you been managing with your relationship with your children? Have they been away the whole time during at school? Or? They have been here since March, oh. and they they're literally <laughs> that's why we're doing this interview outside yeah, yeah, yeah. because they're literally in quarantine during oh, all this time. Good. They have not gone out with their friends since March eighth. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's I mean they're not that they're saints. I wasn't say they're saints, yeah. but they're not. They're just under under threat yeah. of murder. No, just kidding. So but is everybody getting along? All the brothers and sisters? Nobody's fighting over clothes or pretty anything? Pretty much. Pretty Well, there's no clothes, no, nothing to fight over. I mean, they're in leggings and tennis shoes all day long. You know? Life has changed so much. But, um, they, you know, they, the only things they, they, all they do is watch the, the cooking shows and they're cooking and they're baking. So we've all gained like easily 10 pounds. <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating. They're baking. I mean, I, 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 when we do the Instacart every day, every yeah. week, I, they, they keep ordering sugar and I say, why? I just ordered a bag of sugar. Why are, are we consuming so much sugar? It's horrible for you. But they do, you know, banana bread. So they, they do pumpkin bread. They do all kinds of things. Any bread that you can imagine, any dessert that you can imagine, they're doing it. That, that's what I like. Anything that's bread or sugar. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I want to be, be here there. in heaven. <laughs> Igordo. Igordo. Um, during these times where we've been quarantining, there's been the stress of so much bad news on television and a lot of sensationalism on, on TV, um, whether it's political, whether it's social. Um, and this has been something that you have had to report for many years. Um, I wanna ask you from just being a person of experience, not only just professionally, but in life, what do you think is going on right now in the world? Well, uh... In the United States, which is our most immediate world, mm-hmm. um, everything is very polarizing and it's very sad. And um, I just can't comprehend where did we, did we start not believing in scientists? Oh, yeah. That kills me because, I mean, in this world, there's so many things that you may or not believe in. Right. But scientists, <laughs> the scientists that tell you that there's global warming, mm-hmm. the scientists that tell you that you wear a mask, a mask like the one I have here yeah, at all times. And I have mine here. And we took over. Yeah. We took off just for this interview yes. that we're, you know, Distance. socially distant. Um, w- when did we start not believing those things? Yeah. It's like it's like a it's like a bizarre world. I mean, it it. So what's happening is there's a lot of misinformation out there, mm-hmm. and it's not good. I mean, I, we have to stick to the principles of when we grow up. Scientists are to be respected and listened to. And that shouldn't change. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's so crazy because I've had friends who've lost family members. And so there's nothing to think about. Is this real or not? It's people oh, yeah. who get sick. And we all know people by now who's either had it right. or passed away, unfortunately, from it. Um, so I think that as, as you, uh, it's pretty ridiculous that people don't believe in factual things. Yeah, you have to. I mean, and, and I, I'll tell you something. I, now... Of course, that we have new information that it, you may have no immunity. You might get it a second time. And yeah. the second time, you might get it worse. Mm-hmm. Of course, this is so unpleasant for everybody. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you're going to stop believing into the factual information. Right. I mean, we don't want to hear that. Of course not. Nobody <laughs> no. wants to think that this is going to go indefinitely. Um, and, um, you know, I just think that people have to go back to the basics and believe the, uh, the scientists. Mm-hmm. And in regards to more of the social aspect, we've been seeing uh, a lot of people feeling that, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, or we're seeing that Latinos are, are feeling 
a certain kind of way of uh, representation. You know, we're now in we're in, the, we're in September recording right now, um, and it's Latin his, her Heritage Month. What do you what do you what message or what would you what you as a Latina as a minority have to say about these polarizing issues? Well, it's it's a shame. Uh, it's a shame because this country has never been this divided right. ever. Um, sometimes I see the 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 political uh, agenda. Yeah, no, the political mm -hmm. uh, advertisement mm -hmm. on television, and when I see it, I say they're wasting their time because it's so polarized that the people that believe in one candidate right. are not going to be convinced right. and the people that believe in the other candidate are not going to be convinced. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very difficult. Uh, it, it's, it's the kind of thing that I, I wish we weren't, we weren't going through this period. Right. I've seen many elections and many uh, situations with politicians and I never seen what we're going on now. Living yeah, through. I think that um, I'll, what I find interesting about this election is that I feel like if no matter what side, you know, I have friends who are for either or for different yeah, reasons. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I've noticed that if you are for one or the other, it kind of is a dig. People kind of take it more to a personal of like, wow, are you really a good person? Which I think it wasn't that it wasn't like that before. Yeah. It was more based on political, you know, what your values are, maybe religious values or right. financial uh, thoughts. But now it's kind of like, this is who you're voting for? Are you actually my friend? Are you a good person? And I think it's important for us to be able to well, because, conversate and yeah, have friends. Yeah, because with believing in one candidate or the other basically implies that you agree with the way they conduct their lives. Right. Right. That's good. And it's funny because I remember when I was younger, um, I am uh, Puerto Rican and my dad's half Cuban as well. But I tengo más Boricua que Cuba. Uh, and I remember that my, my family, we would go to Puerto Rico maybe once every two years, not too often. We usually used to come to Florida because I'm from Connecticut. Um, and one year when we were in Puerto Rico, I, I don't know what was happening, but the streets were getting crazy with flags and all this political stuff. I was about maybe 10 or 12. And then somebody yelled out the window, cursed at us and tell us, gringo, go home. And I looked at my dad, I was like, you want us to go to Cuba? They're doing this <laughs> to us here. And I always would have my, my, my thoughts about how not only Puerto Rico, but Santo Domingo, La Repúblicas, or, you know, the Commonwealth, the po political things really affect them directly. Right. Where in the United States, for the most part, I don't think up until now, um, things didn't really affect you as much politically. And you wouldn't, your street wouldn't be shut down with people marching exactly. or yelling. And now we are seeing in the streets, I saw it here in South Beach. Uh, where there was a march, a Black, a Black Lives Matter march. And I think it's so interesting that not only are other countries in, so involved in being directed di by politics directly, but now we're also in that same kind of vein. And we can be ignorant before where you would ask people yeah. about something and they didn't have an answer. Now you kind of like have to well, have some. The internet to... has helped a lot with that. Yeah. Even though many times what you get is misinformation. Right. So... Um, we talked about in the beginning of the interview a few things that you, you did, um, producing, television, uh, un poco de todo, like we say. Um, aside from what you're doing now with your son, do you have other dreams that you want to uh, navigate through? I think you're incredible at directing. The Selena thing, I'm, I promise you, was great. And I really like your um, your no basically is is the top success or we don't do it and i think as latinos we have to have that work ethic i was talking to my crew about just you know personal life how important it is to be on time right time of course and que, que la gente no te of miren course. and dicen ah this is just a regular sí, sí, sí. latino no, that you have to. because it's important can you tell can you tell us a little bit about you being uh at one point a news anchor where you were on an american station like when you were there for a little bit uh, host co-hosting, did you always try to do even more, even just being a woman and a Latina woman at that? Um, I always tried to do more and to be excellent in whatever I did, but not singling myself out as like Latina or, or woman, mm -hmm. just because I wanted to excel. And it doesn't matter what the forum is, yeah. for you to excel, you have to 
give 100% more right. than the people that give 100%. That's good because you're also not putting yourself in the box yeah, of, of that. You have to, if you keep, if you, I, you know, if you single yourself out, then you're victimizing yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, other ones might do it, but you don't do it to yourself. And yeah. um, I always try to ignore that unless it's something very obvious, which to me doesn't happen that often because I don't allow it to happen. I mean, I, I always try to to conduct myself in a way that I, I have no room for, you know, discrimination or anything like that. But when I go into like a conference room and there's, let's say, 10 men and myself, mm -hmm. I don't say, oh, my God, me, the only woman and 10 guys. You know, I always think 11 thinking minds. You that's know? great. And that's how you should always approach it. And I think that does something psychologically to how Absolutely. you deliver. Is there any dreams that you have right now that you might be interested in exploring now that you have more free time? Yeah, I yeah, of course. I would love to do more miniseries like the one from El Secreto de Selena, Selena's Secret. That I would like to do. I, I'm, I'm going to start working on the developing of a story for another miniseries. That I'd like to do. And, but that takes time. I mean, yeah. that I tell you this today and three years from now, you right. might yeah. see something materialize. You know, it takes a long time. But it's it's so exciting to conceptualize something, see it in your mind and then see it on the, on the screen. And everything that goes in between, it's it's just magical. Aside from this, your series, I saw, I don't know if you saw it, this, the series of Walter Mercado or the oh, yes. show. Yes. Um, and I know you've worked with him because I that's worked where with him many him. times, many years. Did you see the series? Of course I did. It, okay. was, it was excellent. And yeah, that's good. That's what I wanted to ask. What I loved your thoughts it. about it? I he did was such a, you uh -huh. know, such a legend. He was, you know, bigger than life. He was. I love seeing his. Um, and he was very optimistic, uh -huh. was which is something that I said at the beginning of the interview. Being optimistic is one of the main keys to success as a person and as a professional. That's good. Yeah. And I and, and that series, I liked how his. Um, the grandness of him came through and his humanity and the legendariness of a person as well. And I can tell you something that I'm really interested in is seeing, uh, like I told you off camera, the Latin culture resaltado, you right. know, raised. And people like uh, Walter Mercado, uh, Don Francisco, uh, people who've paved the way, like you, Maria Celeste, you've paved the way for a lot right, of people right. as well. I love, I would love to see more of that in series i would love to see because our next generation right i'm gonna see i don't have any children but we have kids right it's good for them to also know look at that somebody paved the way this is how hard it was yeah, this you have is to what you have to pass information so that other other people have you know the the parameters of how to, to like follow. like i did with my father right well we have to tell the story so that the people can can use that as an information to to be better and as your father you were never tempted to get into politics I've, I've, you're very strong not, opinionated we, and you're yeah that to... and you have to be you cannot <laughs> let them railroad you and i wouldn't um a lot of people have approached me yeah. about that lately and you know i never say never as the right. daughter of a politician i yeah. know that you can never say never because then if you change your mind ever they're going to use that video yeah. clip and <laughs> shove it off your face so no yeah right now it's not in the plans but you okay. never know and uh as a mom uh, I know that you identify yourself as, and some things really strict, and some things you're very, you know, easy yeah. going about. I know a few things you said at home, it had to be Spanish. You'd make believe if yeah. they were speaking in English, que, what are you saying? No entiendo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I threatened them, you speak <laughs> yeah. Spanish, you're not getting this, or you're not getting that, you're not going out. You know? And I like the materialistic thing because, you know, I, I'm, I'm from Orlando and in Connecticut, I lived part of my life. Uh, but in Miami, everywhere I look, I see a name brand. Oh, I know. So that has to be hard for a child, I'm thinking, a younger person where their mind is still developing, be like, pero mami, comprame ese Gucci belt. Oh, I no, are you kidding me? I, I, <laughs> I kill them if they say that. No, 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 no. I, I, when, when they were growing up, I was, I always kept them and I always have kept them very humbled. Right. And um, like to give an example, I, I will never forget one day my daughter went with a girlfriend of hers from school mm -hmm. And the girlfriend of hers said, oh, I don't know what, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm getting this at Abercrombie and Fitch, yeah, she said. Yeah. And my daughter was like, what, what, what is it? And, and she was like, yeah, Abercrombie and Fitch. And, and, and she was like, I don't know what that is. And the daughter, the, the other girl was like, I can't believe it. You know, she was like putting herself <laughs> right. her down and, you know, 
today my, my daughter is a lot more successful right. because she's never wasted her time in those you know banalities and, and superficial right. things you know she navigates in a different dimension of substance and that's important because right now what they're putting at marketing especially through social media yeah. Is brands, and if you don't have this, then and know. nothing against those brands. Claro, it's just because that I like them too. When they're growing up, you cannot buy them everything because then they will have no, no, no need to fight for things. And speaking of your daughter, I know that you said that she was involved in sports. I don't know if it was uh, soccer, volleyball. Or volleyball. Okay, and that there was that you really just like your father, uh, you want to make sure oh, that yes. they do it good. And que le aplaudían, oh, yeah. they would clap for her when she did almost a good job. Yeah, yeah, like like. You, you go to many games, not just volleyball, but everybody that's a parent out there. You go to a volleyball and they, I hated this. They say, you know, they, they miss the ball badly and they go, oh, good try, good try. <laughs> and I'm like, good try. Mm. I kill you. What do you mean, good try? Do 20 laps and then come back and do it again right. <laughs> do it better. I'm yeah, spending my better. time here. Do it better. I mean, that's that's how I was brought up. And if I, if I wasn't brought up that way, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's funny because uh, there's a lot of there's a culture like that right now, right? In baseball, I remember when I was in karate, uh, my dad was there. Él era el único gritando, like, no, don't do that. Listen to him. I'm like, pa, are you teaching me karate? That's me. Or that's is me. he teaching me karate? That's me in the volleyball. <laughs> and he'll even do it with an interview. Did you ask them this? Did you ask my this? Why didn't you do, you know? And, and I appreciate it because you know why? We have those voices in our head. I'm sure like you have your dad probably still in yeah. your head. And you're like, no, tenemos que darlo todo and we have to keep And my going mother, by the way, my yeah. mother, which I haven't mentioned, is the uh -huh. same. My oh, mother, I would have, that. yeah, I, I had a stereo. <laughs> so I had, I, I will have like, I will do a show and I will have like a great interview with somebody that was fantastic and it went perfect. Mm -hmm. In my mind, it went perfect. And um, I will call my mother because I call her about after every show. I used to, I stopped okay. at one yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. And I used to call her after every show and I said, mommy, did you see? Te gustó? You know, <laughs> yeah, did you yeah. like it? And she's like, yeah, 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 it was good. It was good. But why, why do you say it like that? No, no, nothing. But the email, tell me. And she's like, well, just one little thing. You know, here you stumble a little bit and you did it. And I'm like, oh, my God. You, I'm looking at the big picture, you know, and she's looking at the minor details. But all the minor details do a big picture, you know. Right. So she was right. And um, it used to kill me. I used to get so upset. I used to get very upset with her. Uh -huh. But that's how you get better. Right. By looking at the little details. That's a good example that you've had. Uh, earlier you said in the beginning of the interview that um, one of your favorite actors or celebrities was Mel Gibson. Yeah. Uh, you said you had a story about that? Yeah, I met him. I met him and uh, in person because I got to interview him. Mm -hmm. And he was great. And he was, he was very nice. But um, at the time I met him, I think he was going through a... Through a through some issues in mm -hmm. his life. I, it's hard to judge. Right. But he was he seemed to be very pessimistic about life. Okay. So before the interview started, that, that's the impression I got. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's a shame because I really like him. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, I, I've always been I was in love with him <laughs> back in the day. And um, and I had him in front of me. Yeah. But because he was such a pessimist at the time, I don't know what was going on in his life. Yeah. It kind of took away from the enamorment and the, right. and the magic. Yeah. Right. And speaking of interviews, because you've interviewed, I mean, all kinds of uh, socialized and famous people. Um, what advice do you have for people who maybe want to follow in your career steps um, or for just interviewing, whether it's a, maybe a person that has a, a lot of controversy or somebody of great importance, like a president? Well, I think once you're going to do an interview, the, one of the keys is to listen. You have to not just listen, but feel and listen. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people go with a, with a list of questions, mm -hmm. and you can use that as a, as a point that of is. reference. Mm -hmm. But you have to listen because sometimes your best questions are follow-up questions on what the person already said. Mm -hmm. Like you remember that I Mel told you Gibson. the thing about yeah. Mel Gibson and you brought it back. Yeah. So that's good. You, that means you were listening. Gracias, You see me fast. You, you already warm up. Um, so, so that's important to be listening because that also gets the other person engaged. Right. You know, when, when you answer just question after question after question that you prepared before and you're not listening, the person becomes like a robot, robot. just re responding. It's, yeah. It stops being a conversation like that. Like we're conversing. Yeah, I've had 
uh, I have a friend, she's a Christian singer, and I'd watch her on an interview on a live, and when she hangs up, I say, Blanca, her name is Blanca, I'm sorry, I'm putting you out there. Uh, I was like- There's I, many Blancas. <laughs> there's there's many Blancas, you don't know which one. Yeah. Uh, you weren't into that interview. She was like, hey, so they asked the same thing, and then I was like, you're right, because when I research people, uh, I will see the interviews and I'll kind of see the same. And yeah, you, it have makes to, you have sense. to see the interview in your head before the interview. Claro. Yeah. Well, I just want to say that it is a complete honor to have Thank you. you on. Um, this YouTube channel is really just starting. And to have you and Puma on the same week is well, Subscribe to it. Subscribe. Yeah, subscribe. Uh, I know you're really active on, in, on Facebook. Yes. Are you going to be more on, I see you on Instagram too. Yeah, and I'm going to start on YouTube too, so I'm going to be your competition. I want to see you on YouTube. Subscribe, yes. Maria Celeste Arraraz <laughs> is my channel. Good, that was, was going to be yeah, my question. Yeah, Maria Celeste Arraraz, A-R-R-A-R-A-S, because spelling is important. That is important, especially for people who don't know how to spell <laughs> Spanish names. Yeah, of course, that's why. Well, thank you so much for having me at your house. Thank you, uh, thank you for what you've shared with me. I wish you much success to everything and me that you too. do. Me too, I wish you a lot of success thank you. in this YouTube channel. I hope... Everybody says yes to interviews. Yes. And they subscribe, too. subscribe, me subscribe. Too. And I really would like to see some BTS of you mamaging. Is that yes. what is that is that a word I just made yeah. up? Yeah, mamaging. Yeah, that's I guess <laughs> what it is. Mama Ger Mama Mama Jing. Mama Jing, Mama Jing my no son. Say. Yeah. Oh my god. But thank you so much again. Don't forget to subscribe and and watch this next video. Only if it's me. If it's somebody else, don't watch it.